the terrestrial plane, or the true figure of the earth, scripturally and scientifically demonstrated by Frederick H. Cook. Professor Haeckel informs us that the world is nothing else than an eternal evolution of substance, and that this periodical process of evolution is really caused by the inherent primitive properties of substance, feeling, and inclination, which he says are active causes. What does he mean? He tells us in plain and unmistakable language in the edition of the Riddle of the Universe of 1902, page 92, therein he says, No philosopher has done more than Immanuel Kant in defining the profound distinction between efficient and final causes with relation to the interpretation of the whole cosmos. In his well-known earlier work on the general natural history and theory of the heavens, he made a bold attempt to treat the constitution and the mechanical origin of the entire fabric of the universe according to the Newtonian laws. This cosmological nebular theory was based entirely on the mechanical phenomena of gravitation. It was expanded and mathematically established later on by Laplace when the famous French astronomer was asked by Napoleon where God, the creator and sustainer of all things, came in in his system. He clearly and honestly replied, Sir, I have managed without that hypothesis. That indicated the atheistic character which this mechanical cosmogony shares with all other inorganic sciences. This is the more noteworthy because the theory of Kant and Laplace is now almost universally accepted. Every attempt to supersede it has failed. When atheism is denounced as a grave reproach, as it often is, it is well to remember that the reproach extends to the whole of modern science insofar as it gives a purely mechanical interpretation of the inorganic world. We will continue our investigations further as to when and how the world began to evolve itself. In the beginning, there was gas, or nebulous cloud, according to scientists and evolutionists. This is rather a difficult subject to deal with, because, as we have already read, there was scientifically no beginning, just an eternal evolution of substance. Anyway, there was a time when this nebulous cloud arose, never mind where it came from, for no scientist has yet even attempted an explanation on this point, although its existence requires some accounting for, considering that it was inorganic matter, and it possessed the powers of feeling and inclination, according to Laplace, the particles forming the cloud were very hot. He was not there to see, but I only mention this because some scientists, like Herbert Spencer, state that the embryo universe was cold. Anyway, hot or cold, the particles by universal suffrage, or by some other method unknown to scientists, took upon themselves to form the solar system. Therefore, it was necessary that this diffused fire mist should condense a little and move its particles a little closer together, according to Newtonian laws. As the Newtonian laws of attraction or gravitation formed the basis of this world-building nebular theory, let us consider these laws. Sir Robert Ball tells us that every body in the universe attracts every other body. He also says that the law of gravitation underlies the whole of astronomy. But when we read in A Million of Facts by Sir Richard Phillips that universal gravitation is an utterly impossible mode of action, I think at time we consulted Sir Isaac Newton on the matter. I find, according to a letter he sent to Dr. Bentley, February 1692, that he expressed the opinion that attraction should be innate and inherent in matter so that one body can act upon another at a distance, is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has in philosophical matters a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. I shall never fall into it especially considering Sir Isaac Newton's words that gravity must be caused by an agent acting according to certain laws, but whether this agent be material or immaterial, I have left to the consideration of my readers. Professor Bernstein's consideration is that the theory that motions are produced through material attraction is absurd. Perhaps Sir Isaac Newton agrees, for he says, what I call attraction may be performed by impulse, or by some other means unknown to me. Well, if Sir Isaac Newton does not know, we must not be surprised that C. V. Boys, F. R. S., etc., says, It is a mysterious power, which no man can explain. Of its propagation through space, all men are ignorant. I quite believe this, and also the following written by Professor Singer and Behrens. A body on earth falls to the ground? This is observation. 
body and earth attract each other? This is an obvious and necessary inference, and inference only. Dear me, I shall believe, as Professor W. B. Carpenter says, we have no certain experience at all. The doctrine of universal gravitation, then, is a pure assumption. The fact is that gravity is not required. There is not the slightest evidence in the universe around us of the existence of such a mysterious power. In Joyce's scientific dialogues, we read, It seems very surprising that philosophers who have discovered so many things have not been able to find out the cause of gravity. Had Sir Isaac Newton been asked why a marble dropped from the hand falls to the ground, could he not have assigned a reason? That great man, probably the greatest man that ever adorned the world, was as modest as he was great, and he would have told you he knew not the cause. This is valuable evidence coming from believers in the theory of gravitation. The learned Dr. Price asks, Who does not remember a time when he would have wondered at the question, Why does water run downhill? What ignorant man is there who is not persuaded that he understands this perfectly? But every improved man knows it to be a question he cannot answer. For the descent of water, like that of other heavy bodies, depends on the attraction of gravitation, the cause of which is still involved in darkness. Well, it is astounding. Newton invents a theory which admittedly has no known foundation in nature, a pulling, a pushing power called gravitation. Nobody understands its working. No one knows anything about its cause. It has never been seen, tested, or felt. Yet such a person as Pope wrote, Nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, Let Newton be, and all was light. Where is the light? A question is asked of an improved man, and he cannot answer. Why does water run downhill? Why does it not run uphill? If the earth is a globe, it does both. Fancy. There are, so scientists say, 21,923,200 cubic miles of land and 323,722,000 cubic miles of water in the globe. Whatever keeps this preponderance of water underneath and on the top and on the sides and all round the outside of the comparatively small portion of land? Water does run downhill. Why does it not run down the globe hill and fall off? Light is coming. Gravity is a theoretical power necessary to the theory that the solar system made itself into numerous rotating, whirling globes, each one that has been, is, or will be capable, perhaps of supporting life as we understand it, upon its surface. Apart from this theory, in all its ramifications, gravity can find no place in nature. Leave paper astronomy and come out in the light of nature. Why does a balloon ascend? Because, bulk for bulk, it is lighter than the air. It will rise to a position, at that elevation it will stay, because it will have found its equilibrium. When it loses its bulk, by an escape of gas, it will collapse and descend to earth again, for the simple reason that its weight is greater than that of the air it displaces. Wood floats in water. A piece of solid iron sinks. Why? Because bulk for bulk, the wood is lighter than the water it displaces, whereas bulk for bulk, the iron is heavier than the water. The denser a body, the greater its weight. Recognizing this truth, scientists say, gravity is another name for weight. They may call it gravitation, if they choose to do so, but when an apple falls to the earth, it falls by its own weight when released from the stalk on which it grew, not because the apple has been pulled by the earth, or the earth pulled by the apple. Considering all the contradictions and uncertainties of the scientific world as to what is or is not gravity, its very existence being questioned, the following words, by Professor T. H. Huxley, are highly significant. If the law of gravitation ever failed to be true, even to the smallest extent, for that period the calculations of the astronomer have no application. Discovery of Neptune From the foregoing chapter, it is obvious that science can supply no information when we ask for the origin of matter or motion. In fact, when we ask about origins, science is dumb. The world-building scientists who build on atoms, or little somethings, cannot prove the atomic theory upon which they build, or even tell us the origin of atoms, or how they came to be diffused through space, or by what law diffused matter did aggregate. Camille Flammarion, a popular astronomer, says, The most probable hypothesis, the most scientific theory, is that which represents the sun as a condensed nebula. This carries us back to an unknown epoch when this nebula occupied the present place of the solar system. 
Let us imagine, then, an immense gaseous mass placed in space. Attraction is a force inherent in every atom of matter. The denser portion of this mass will insensibly attract toward it the other parts, and in the slow fall of the more distant molecules toward this more attractive region, a general motion is produced, incompletely directed toward this center, and soon involving the whole mass in the same motion of rotation. It has begun to turn so quickly as to develop at the exterior circumference a centrifugal force superior to the general attraction of the mass, as when we whirl a sling. The inevitable consequence of this excess is a rupture of the equilibrium, which detaches an external ring. This gaseous ring will continue to rotate in the same time and with the same velocity, but the nebulous matter will be henceforth detached, and will continue to undergo progressive condensation and acceleration of motion. This same feat will be reproduced as often as the velocity of rotation surpasses that by which the centrifugal force remains inferior to the attraction. According to this scientific theory, this most probable hypothesis, the planets were detached from the condensed sun mass we are to imagine how. Lord Salisbury, when president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, asked the following question that has not yet been answered. If the earth is a detached bit, whirled off the mass of the sun, how comes it that in leaving him we cleaned him out so completely of his nitrogen and oxygen that not a trace of these gases remains to be discovered even by the sensitive vision of the spectroscope? Sir Robert Ball informs us that some of the elements which are of the greatest importance on earth would appear to be missing from the sun. Sulfur, phosphorus, mercury, gold, nitrogen may be mentioned among the elements which have hitherto given no indication of their being solar constituents. But there are many objections to the probability of the nebular theory being true, even supposing the world to be a globe. It is well known that the planets revolve around the sun from west to east, but totally ignoring the nebular hypothesis, it was stated a short time back by Professor Lancaster that one of the satellites of Saturn went round that planet the wrong way, thus calling for a fundamental revision of our ideas of the origin of the solar system. This is not the only instance. The moons of Uranus, instead of rotating from west to east, rotate from east to west, while the planes of their revolution are nearly at right angles to the orbit of their parent Uranus. Sir Robert Ball says that we are not in a position to give any satisfactory explanation of this circumstance. I am about to describe now what Sir Robert Ball calls a discovery so extraordinary that the whole annals of science may be searched in vain for a parallel. I must be as brief as possible, and yet develop the account of this striking epoch in the history of science with the fullness of detail which is commensurate with its importance. It is supposed that the supreme controlling power in the solar system is the attraction of the sun, and that every planet in the system revolves around the sun in an elliptical path. Newton's laws of gravitation, of course, underlies all this supposition. According to this law, every body in the universe attracts every other body. The planet Uranus was observed to have perturbations. Le Verrier, a great French astronomer, set himself to investigate the cause of this disturbance. The influences of older planets were found to be inadequate to account for the perturbations, so Le Verrier commenced a search by the aid of mathematical investigation for an unknown planet. It also appears that another astronomer, Mr. Adams, had undertaken the same task as Le Verrier, each being ignorant of the other's labor. Now for the discovery. On the night of the 23rd of September, the sky being clear, a telescope was pointed in accordance with Le Verrier's instructions. The field of view showed a multitude of stars. One of these was really the planet Neptune. The next night, the object was again observed. It had moved, and when its motion was measured, it was found to accord precisely with what Le Verrier had foretold. Indeed, as if no circumstance in the confirmation should be wanting, the diameter of the planet, as measured by the micrometers at Berlin, proved to be practically coincident with that anticipated by Le Verrier. The world speedily rang with the news of this splendid achievement. Instantly the name of Le Verrier rose to a pinnacle hardly surpassed by that of any astronomer of any age or country. The circumstances of the discovery were highly dramatic. We picture the great astronomer buried in profound meditation for many months. His eyes are bent, not on the stars, but on his calculations. No telescope is in his hand. The human intellect is the instrument he alone uses. With patient labor, guided by consummate mathematical skill, he manipulates his columns of figures. He attempts one solution after another. 
In each he learns something to avoid. By each he obtains some light to guide him in his future labors. At length he begins to see harmony in those results, when before there was discord. Gradually the clouds disperse, and he discerns with a certainty, little short of actual vision, the planet glittering in the far depths of space. He rises from his desk and invokes the aid of a practical astronomer, and lo, there is the planet in the indicated spot. The annals of science present no such spectacle as this. It was the most triumphant proof of the law of universal gravitation. The joyful bells of the scientific world, however, soon stopped ringing. The above splendid achievement, the most triumphant proof of the law of universal gravitation, has been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Mr. Babinet, September 15, 1848, read a paper before the French Academy of Sciences as follows. The only sittings of the Academy of late in which there was anything worth recording, and even this was not of a practical character, were those of the 29th and the 11th. On the former day, Mr. Babinet made a communication respecting the planet Neptune, which has been generally called Mr. Leverrier's planet, the discovery of it having, as it was said, been made by him from theoretical deductions, which astonished and delighted the scientific public. What Mr. Leverrier had inferred from the action on other planets of some body which ought to exist was verified, at least so it was thought at the time, by actual vision. Neptune was actually seen by other astronomers, and the honor of the theorist obtained additional luster. But it appears from a communication of Mr. Babinet that this is not the planet of Leverrier. He had placed his planet at a distance from the sun equal to thirty-six times the limit of the terrestrial orbit. Neptune revolves at a distance equal to 30 times of these limits, which makes a difference of nearly 200 millions of leagues. Le Verrier had assigned to his planet a body equal to 38 times that of the Earth. Neptune has only one-third of this volume. Mr. Le Verrier had stated the revolution of his planet round the sun to take place in 217 years. Neptune performs its revolutions in 166 years. Thus, then, Neptune is not Mr. Leverrier's planet, and all his theory as regards to that planet falls to the ground. Mr. Leverrier may find another planet, but it will not answer the calculations which he made for Neptune. In the sitting of the 14th, Mr. Leverrier noticed the communication of Mr. Babinet, and to a great extent admitted his own error. He complained, indeed, that much of what he said was taken in too absolute a sense, but he evinces much more candor than might have been expected from a disappointed explorer. Mr. Le Verrier may console himself with the reflection that if he has not been so successful as he thought he had been, others might have been equally unsuccessful, and as he has still before him an immense field for the exercise of observation and calculation, we may hope that he will soon make some discovery which will remove the vexation of his present disappointment. It must not be supposed that Neptune was never observed until the time of the above recorded discovery. Several instances of Neptune being discovered have been noted and marked as a star on the catalogues of earlier astronomers. On May 8th and 10th, 1795, Lalande observed the same star. Even supposing that Leverrier had fully proved his case, it would neither have proved the theory of gravitation true, nor the tremendous distance of the stars and their gigantic sizes as postulated. The perturbations of Uranus were more likely caused by the known powers of magnetism and electricity, for we must not lose sight of the fact that there is every reason to suppose and believe that the sun is the seat of electrical phenomena. As to the distances and size of the stars, we shall have more to say later on, but with assurance we say now that there is not an astronomer who knows the distance or size to any of them. One is led to believe that the star distances and magnitudes are calculated according to the method John Wesley suggested was employed. Distance proves the magnitude, and the great magnitude proves the tremendous distance. Eclipses It is often asserted that the globular theory must be true because astronomers can predict eclipses most accurately. If the capability of predicting eclipses is going to determine the truth or otherwise of any world system, we should get a confused medley of true systems, for all theories regarding the order of the universe claim the power to foretell eclipses, one as accurately as the other. It should be recognized that practical astronomy, a science of observation for the study and development of which the Greenwich Observatory was established, is independent of any and every theory. 
Eclipses are not timed by any calculation concerning the rate or distance at which the earth be supposed to fly round the sun and the moon round the earth, or by the rate at which the moon and sun travel over the earth. The calculations necessary to locate future eclipses are based upon the records of past observances of these periodically recurring phenomena. Eclipses occur in cycles. An eclipse of the moon occurs again after a cycle of practically 18 years, 10 and one-third days. If all the eclipses are observed in this period, it would be possible to foretell all future ones. A certain amount of mathematical skill, of course, is necessary. It was by this rule that ancient astronomers accurately predicted eclipses. Thales, who lived 600 years before the birth of Christ, predicted eclipses. Ptolemy also foretold eclipses for hundreds of years to come. Egyptian, Hindu, and Chinese astronomers of ancient times foretold eclipses. A. McInnes, in his work on pagan astronomy, says, More than 2,000 years ago the Chaldeans presented to Alexander the Great, at Babylon, tables of eclipses for 1,993 years, and the ancient Greeks made use of the cycle of 18 years, 11 days, the interval between two consecutive eclipses on the same dimensions. Mere theorizing about the sun and moon, the great unerring clocks of time, has thrown chronology and the calendar into confusion and hence scientists cannot agree as to the world's age. If the facts already given are not sufficient to convince the reader that the globular theory has nothing whatsoever to do with the accuracy of eclipse occurrences, the following from New Principia by Morrison may effectually convince the student. Eclipses, occultations, the position of the planets, the motion of the fixed stars, the whole of practical navigation, the grand phenomena of the course of the sun, and the return of comets, may all and every one of them be as accurately, nay, more accurately known, without the farrago of mystery the mathematicians have adopted to throw dust in the eyes of the people, and to claim honors to which they have no just title. The public generally believe that the longitudes of the heavenly bodies are calculated on the principles of Newton's laws. Nothing could be more false. How are eclipses of the moon caused? Our astronomers of the globular theory school tell us that a time comes when the earth lies directly between the moon and the sun. The moon is thus plunged into the shadow of the earth. The light from the sun that the moon is supposed to reflect is intercepted, and the moon is eclipsed. This is very remarkable, and I doubt its possibility, considering that even in the depth of a total eclipse, the moon remains visible, and actually glows with a bright copper-colored hue. But there are even greater objections than this against the shadow theory. Now, according to the globular theory, a lunar eclipse occurs when the sun, earth, and moon are in a direct line. But it is on record that since about the 15th century, over 50 eclipses have occurred while both sun and moon have been visible above the horizon. The accompanying illustration will show how utterly impossible it is to harmonize this fact with even the globularist's own theory. The horizon to an observer on the earth would be at right angles from a perpendicular line where he stood, and above this horizon, overhead, was the sun and moon visible, the moon eclipsed. One may read carefully a whole host of scientific books before finding the information that there have been several instances of lunar eclipses being seen with both sun and moon above the horizon. Why this silence? Writing to the Astronomer Royal on this subject, I was informed that the above phenomenon was caused by refraction, which caused the sun and moon to appear above the horizon when wholly below it. Ah, of course. Professor Airy once said, one of the most troublesome things an astronomer has to deal with is refraction. But it seems a bit convenient at times. Is the phenomena of a lunar eclipse with both the sun and moon visible above the horizon due to refraction? Let us consider the position. First, the globularists admit that the facts observed in nature relative to this case do not agree with their globular theory. That is a proper admission to make. A theory concerning the operation of refraction, instead of clearing up the difficulty, really adds to the dilemma. What has refraction to do in the matter? The moon has visibly risen, and the sun has not yet set, in accordance with accurate almanac time, and an eclipse of the moon is due and takes place through refraction? It must be refraction, astronomers say so. We will now deal with refraction. Refraction only operates when our line of sight, or array of light, passes from one medium into another of different density. Get a basin, place it where a light causes part of the rim to cast a shadow into the bowl, place, say, a penholder obliquely in the basin, and then pour in some water, 
and you will see that refraction will apparently raise the immersed part of the pen holder, while the shadow will go back and down. Now apply the experimental knowledge thus gained to the theory before us. If refraction did throw up the sun and moon, then refraction would throw the shadow further down away from the moon, and there could not be an eclipse. And so it is impossible for astronomers to prove our Earth, terra firma, to be a heavenly body whirling and spinning between the two luminaries, the sun and moon. They say, the shadow of the Earth on the moon proves the world a globe. Oh, how are we to know that it is the shadow of the Earth? Is there any special way of identifying it? Might it not be the shadow of some other moving dark body? It is supposed that the Earth is a globe because the shadow on the moon is curved. But it is not only a globe that can cast a circular shadow on a sphere. Experiment with an orange, a cube, and a lighted candle in a dark room, and whatever shadow that is cast on the orange by the cube will be curved. How could it be otherwise? Eclipses of the moon may be caused in several ways. I do not profess to know how they are produced, for I believe, as it says in Ecclesiastes 8th chapter, that a man cannot find out all the work that is done under the sun, because though a man labor to seek it out, yet shall he not find it. Yea, further, though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. We cannot know all the works of God. We know that there are dark bodies in the sky. The moon may be eclipsed by the periodical motion of one of these. Eclipses of the sun and moon, or any celestial phenomena, cannot prove the earth to be a globe, or even flat. It is most illogical to search the sky for proof as to the shape of the earth. It is quite possible to determine the figure of the earth while we are on it. Having done this, all that occurs in the sky must be explained, if explained at all, in harmony with the ascertained fact that the earth is a plane. The Sun's Distance Sir Richard Proctor, in his work on the Sun, informs us that the determination of the Sun's distance is not only an important problem of general astronomy, but it may be regarded as the very foundation of all our researches. So it is the foundation of all their researches, in fact, the assumed distance of the Sun from the Earth is the measuring rod used by the astronomer to determine all other distances. What is the length of this measuring rod? What kind of foundation are the researches of the astronomer built upon? Let us see. Sir Robert Ball informs us that the dimensions of our luminary are commensurate with his importance. Astronomers have succeeded in the difficult task of ascertaining the exact figures, but they are so gigantic that the results are hard to realize. He says, The actual distance of the sun from the earth is about 92,900,000 miles. Fancy the actual distance being about. No doubt it is advisable to have a saving clause about in the exact science of astronomy, for Professors Airy and Stone gave the distance of the sun from the earth as 91,400,000 miles. Evidently, they made a slight mistake in a few millions, because Enki knew the distance to be 95 million miles in winter, and a few million miles less in summer. This is not an exact scientific statement, considering that it is summer in one part of the earth, and that it is winter in another part of the earth at the same time. But this is a scientific trifle. For after all, what is a matter of 2 million miles in 95 million? When we come to Copernicus, we find him stating that the distance of the sun from earth to be 3 million. What? Your book says 5 million miles. Oh yes, it's all right. The 3 million miles was an earlier guess. I beg pardon, calculation. The ideas of ancient astronomers as to the distance of the sun from the earth were not quite so great as the ideas of modern astronomers, although no doubt they consider themselves quite as accurate as do modern astronomers in their statements of actual distance. Pythagoras gave as his estimate of the sun's distance from earth a matter of 44,000 miles. However, he was wrong, right enough, for Tycho Brahe and others knew the distance of the sun to be about 13 million miles above the earth. Some time afterward, it was shown that even Tycho Brahe was a few millions of miles out, and his observations must have led Kepler millions of miles astray. For in 1670, Cassini demonstrated, in the usual way of astronomers, that the distance of the sun from the earth was 85 million miles. No doubt he did his best, but of what avail were his efforts when Sir Isaac Newton, afterwards, gave the distance as 28 million miles, or 54 million? No need to be particular, for Sir Isaac Newton said himself, either distance would do very well. I am sorry to say it, but I am afraid Newton was forgetful or ungrateful, as the basis of his labors were the laws of Kepler, 
but he totally ignored the distance of the sun from the earth according to Kepler's law, 12,376,880 miles. Mayer gives the sun's distance as over 104 million miles. One of the latest globular theories, Koreshian astronomy, which claims to interpret all ancient legends and mythologies and to furnish the basis of all reason and science, emphatically states that the distance of the sun from the earth is about 4,000 miles. Some say it is about 96 million miles. I do not give all the authorities with their actual and about distances, but according to the globular theory, the distance of the sun from the earth may be anything between 4,000 miles and 104 million miles. This represents the astronomical measuring rod, the foundation of all our researches. With the above futile results of attempts to ascertain the distance of the sun before us, a thoughtful consideration of the following scripture may serve a useful purpose. Thus saith Jehovah, which giveth the sun for the light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Jehovah of hosts is his name. If these ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me for ever. Thus saith Jehovah, If heaven above can be measured, and the foundation of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done. The heaven for height, and the earth for depth. There is no searching. Astronomers with their various ideas concerning the sun's distance speak concerning millions of miles as though they were but inches. In fact, it is as Joyce in his scientific dialogues says, We talk of millions, with as much ease of hundreds or tens, but it is not perhaps possible for the mind to form any adequate conception of such high numbers. Several methods have been adopted to assist the mind in comprehending these vast distances. You have some idea of the swiftness with which a cannonball proceeds from the mouth of a gun, at the rate of about eight miles in a minute. The numbers of minutes in a year is 525,600, so it would take a cannonball traveling at the rate of eight miles a minute, 22 years to reach the sun from the earth. The exact figures concerning the size of the sun are as various and as unreliable as the distances given. We are informed that the sun is more than a million times larger than the earth, with a diameter variously estimated by modern astronomers in harmony with their different ideas as to its distance. According to Russell, the diameter of the sun is 882,000 miles. But Gaburn says that it has a diameter of 850,000 miles. And Sir Robert Ball, of exact figure fame, has found the diameter to be 866,000 miles. When this gigantic sun is considered, one really must wonder where the supply of fuel is obtained from to maintain the great heat it must have. It is also curious to note, supposing, according to modern astronomy, that all the heat we get actually comes from the sun, that the nearer we get to the sun, the greater is the cold. On lofty mountains, even under the equator, are to be found never-melting snows, and at sea level the hottest parts of the earth are not under the equator, which, of course, is supposed to be nearest to the sun but are places some degrees about ten north or south of the equator. Our astronomers seem to think that their explanations concerning the earth and celestial phenomena are almost complete. They may yet learn that there is more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in their philosophy. Job said, in enumerating what he knew to be idolatry and sin against God, If I beheld the sun when it shined, or the moon walking in brightness, and my heart had been secretly enticed, or my mouth had kissed my hand, this were also an iniquity to be punished by the judge, for I should have denied the God that is above. It is well known that sun worship was practiced at the time in which Job lived, and many years after his time we find God's prophets lamenting the fact that those who by their knowledge ought to have done better were worshipping the sun, moon, and all the host of heaven. It will no doubt come as a revelation to many to learn that heliolatry, or sun worship, is still practiced, and in this country. It is not really to be wondered at when such men as Sir Robert Ball say, For the power to live and move, for the plenty with which we are surrounded, for the beauty with which nature is adorned, we are immediately indebted to one body in the countless host of space, and that body is the sun. I would ask my readers, after having read through this work, before drawing any hasty conclusions for or against the arguments herein, to carefully consider the fact that they have been trained, perhaps from early childhood, to believe the globular theory true. It is a compulsory subject at school, 
and the plain earth teaching is never referred to except perhaps in derogatory terms by teachers who could not give a lucid exposition of our standpoint considering also that such men as our titled astronomers go out of their way to inform the public that it is only the untutored mind that believes the earth to be flat it is not to be wondered that so many people consciously or unconsciously are prejudiced against any teaching not in harmony with the globular theory